Hey, it's Andrew Huang. A few years ago, I started telling my friends that I had an opportunity to go to space, and they all believed me. I didn't keep up the charade, I told them what I was planning, but it was fascinating to me that in this day and age, it was believable that someone like me could go to space. So this was my plan. I had this idea about a space adventure story, eventually named Space Time, that I wanted to incorporate into my art and my content. In case you missed my last video, I'm in space now. I did want people to believe it for a moment, but then experience the delight of it turning into this fantastical story. But it got out of hand. Way too many people believed it for way too long. Newsweek ran an article to debunk it. Thousands and thousands of people thought that I was actually in space, including some of my own friends who I hadn't talked to about the project before. And part of what I wanted to do with this series was comment on misinformation in the internet age and the performative nature of social media. And I discovered that these things are even more potent than I originally thought. So we're gonna talk about that in this video. We're gonna talk about the visual effects, sets, costumes, story, and the music of space time. This is how and why I spent four years faking a space mission. Also, if you haven't watched all of space time yet, this video is entirely spoilers. Hello. You sent me a message that was like, hey, I wanna go to space. We have A, B, and explosion? Yeah. Where do we go from here? We don't have a huge budget. We don't have Skywalker sound. We don't have like a crazy huge visual effects team. We have one guy. In three, two, one, action. Are we gonna build all of the sets practically? Is it all gonna be CGI? Are we gonna go to a desert? Are we just gonna shoot the entire thing on green screen? Like, we had to answer so many of those questions. Kaya and I shaped the story over the course of about a year, and as different aspects of it solidified, Phil and I would problem solve how we were gonna create them. This whole project was just like, and then what if this happens? And then what if this happens? Until we're actually doing it. Yeah, and then we realize, <laughs> oh, we messed up. Oh, we took on too much, no. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm gonna be leaving soon. And I don't mean YouTube, just Earth. So nobody knew it at the time, but this was the first episode of Space Time with me looking all sad in the thumbnail. And this is totally taking advantage of that kind of clickbait YouTuber goodbye video. But it wasn't about me leaving YouTube, it was about me leaving Earth. I start by just casually mentioning that I have an opportunity to go to space because I thought it was the only way to get even a moment of belief out of viewers. I thought by the end of this episode, when you see the actual space stuff, the shenanigans would be painfully obvious. This completely unrealistic space suit, green screening me into other launch footage, these Hollywood angles of me in the cockpit, I'm the only person on the ship and I'm driving it. I thought all of this was a giveaway. I was hoping for a reaction from people like, I know that this isn't real, but it seems fun and I'm excited to see where it goes, uh, which was the reaction from a lot of people. But there was also a lot of actually believing that I went to space. Bro, he's in space. This was was unexpected. I've done a lot of fictional stuff on my channel before, giving myself superpowers, interacting with a clone, incorporating a multi-video time travel narrative. This is Andrew from the future. The idea with Space Time was to take that to the next level, experimenting with format and genre, pushing the boundaries of YouTube a bit, and commenting on and parodying authenticity in social media. I was thinking to myself, it's fine. Once episode two comes, people will definitely clue in. Episode two comes. Engaging artificial gravity. That's convenient. So the second episode acts as a title sequence for the series. It's sort of like a theme song where the first episode was a cold open. This was a really creatively satisfying structural decision that I made that nobody picked up on. Which is fair enough because it is more than a title sequence. It's a video where I have four different composers score the same title sequence as an experiment to see how the music affects the reception of the visuals. Funny side note, one of the things that made some of the believers question things was that I had internet access in space, which is one of the only true things about what we depicted. 
astronauts have internet access. Some people were even skeptical until they Googled the name of our fake space agency, Luminautics, and found the super basic website that we'd set up for it, and then they believed it. Also, at the beginning of this episode, I spell out exactly what's going on. A sci-fi show about a music producer going to space on a mission to discover some of the universe's strangest secrets while also struggling to upload creative educational music content to his YouTube channel. I thought for sure people must know that we are engaging in theater, and a few more people did, but many still did not. And my plan was that I wanted it to take some time to reach this distant planet that I was supposedly headed to. Like I would have to make a bunch of videos just confined to the ship to kind of make this thing feel like it was happening in real time. And uh, also just the idea of doing my usual content in space is really funny to me. There's the tiniest bit of world building. Like you see more of the spaceship, you see my space food. I show people around the ship. I do a proper introduction of Brick, my AI companion. And I explain the mission. Now the reason why I'm even out here at all is time crystals. Time crystals. So if people made it to this part where I'm telling them that I need to go to another planet to collect crystals that allow me to time travel, they definitely know they're watching a story now. This was also where more of my YouTube parody started creeping in because this was like the tour video. Every YouTuber does a tour of their studio or their home. This is the habitat. It's where I Habitate. Later in the series, I did the apology video. I even parodied myself because there were times where I would do that thing of creating music using sounds that I found in my environment, but I had created all the sounds in my environment. I'm recording spaceship sounds today. This was me earnestly doing the exact same thing on a completely fabricated set. Hi. <laughs> you are humble about. I asked my friends Joy and Rose, who create art as the Broadbent Sisters, if they would want to join this project to help build practical sets that Phil and I would combine with computer graphics and on-location shooting. Hey, it's Andrew Wong. Can I start by sure. saying, when we get a phone call <laughs> from Essa that says, can you make a spaceship and a cave? <laughs> and I was like, oh, these people, they get us. They get us. <laughs> and this all happened right before 2020, right? Right before, right before we all wanted to go to spaceship and get out of here. Um, you're very on point <laughs> with wanting to leave Earth. <laughs> so we had this kind of oh, yeah. wooden frame on the outside that Essa helped build. And then the panels were lined up along the frame, but were easily exchangeable. The main panels were just the pink insulation panels you would put in a ceiling, like an attic. Those shapes were already made. We didn't have to make a mold. We didn't have to like have somebody carve something. They were relatively cheap and they looked really good, really minimal, really nice lines. I feel like the aesthetic of the spaceship was this space odyssey yeah. meets Puff Daddy music video. Today we are shooting all of the airlock starboard orientation scenes. Action. Rick, you're supposed to listen to me. All of the sets that we built had to be built inside your studio. But we knew that we wanted like a long corridor and we didn't have the ability to do that. So we were like, well, what if we just built like just one little chunk of a spaceship and then just throw green up. So I took like photos of the actual hallway that we built to basically recreate CGI versions of those corridors. Then I could just like copy and paste digital chunks of corridor as many times as we wanted. It was funny how well it did end up working. We really make it feel like there's a bunch of different hallways I'm running through, yeah. and it's literally the same, the you know, same 12 way. feet of space that I'm running and changing directions and like coming through a door, coming through a door the other direction. Any single time that we wanted to like turn around and see the other side of the corridor, we had to literally take off every single panel that was different, switch it to the other side, put it back up, and then shoot that out. And there you go. Every time we wanna look at the room from the other side, that's what we do. We spaceship. We did make a real map just for thinking about shooting and like what direction I'm running and trying to keep that consistent. We're like, okay, well, this is how much hallway there's gonna be. This is what direction you turn to get into the habitat. The funniest thing though, when I think about the corridors and the green screen is you having to like run full tilt through the corridor, but like literally on the other end of that door, it's just like wall. Three, two, one, action. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs>
Okay, we just finished filming our first full day of spaceship stuff, and uh, it's going pretty good, right? Uh, it's, it's going okay. It's, it's happening. It's happening. Yeah. happening for sure. I think we're gonna just make it. Here's some fun stuff we shot. Here's my spacesuit. Have a wipe down. You can see the ocean of sweat that I emerge from every take. Wow. I feel like our original goal was to get it done in like two months, right? How long did it take? A year? <laughs> We're with Kit, who made Hello. costumes. Oh my gosh. I still think it looks awesome. This is like a face mask. And then under here, there's a bike helmet. The backing here is all of the foam. We just, it was literally just built out of problems. <laughs> and we tried to make it look as cool as possible. I mean, the first time either of us had built a costume like that. I guess this is the wetsuit. It's in a bag because it smells terrible. <laughs> the, the main body. Is the battery still powered? Oh, 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 oh. This would uh, basically just like suck onto here and then we'd just Velcro it in. These aren't even real buckles, it's all carved. Almost the entire costume is just <laughs> these like dirt cheap gym mats. It's what a lot of cosplayers use to create their costumes. And the reason why we went with this is because it's cheap. We didn't need to cast molds. It's really forgiving. It's really easy to like move about and get it into shape, cut, glue it together. Like when you look at that and then <laughs> that. <laughs> First costume came out amazing. We did it. Good job. This is the last time I ever have to put on the shoe, which is an ordeal every time. That's the suit. We're shooting all this green screen stuff just in my studio. Look at how janky this is. The cockpit stuff, the only part of it that's real, it's this old Roland V drum kit that I've taken all the drums off of. This is just the stand. And then these are like handles from some kind of camera rig that are just like attached on here with clamps. It's so janky. Oh, oh shit. Oh my, oh. this screen's falling. Okay. We don't do that. So we already had the model of the like outside of the ship. So if we're cutting from like outside the cockpit, which is completely CG, to like inside the cockpit, there's no way that we could build a set that would remotely look the same. We just ended up going with a completely CG green screen cockpit. Hey, it's Andrew Huang. Still on the spaceship, and I was thinking for a random experiment today, I wanna to try and create a piece of music that uses the lowest note possible for humans to hear. So that was the next episode. It's one of my favorite videos on my whole channel, and it captures exactly what I wanted to do with this series. There's still educational music content. I make this banging track. Uh, there's a story involved with amazing visual effects, and the music is a part of the story. We learn that this low frequency that I use in my music triggers Brick to reboot. And weaving the music into the content and into the story was so creatively fulfilling. I've done this a lot on my channel where I'll be making music and then that music becomes the soundtrack to a travel vlog within the same video. And this was like the next level of that. It was also a really cool way to find inspiration because we were building this world that was giving me so many moods and uh, ideas. And then also I needed to soundtrack specific moments. So I would compose music for those and ended up creating some of my favorite material ever. So anyway, in this episode, the dubstep disables Brick, and right then, with amazing storytelling timing, the ship is headed right into an asteroid field. Incoming asteroids? I don't think I saw any asteroids. Okay, yep. There's a concept called Chekhov's gun in screenwriting. The idea of whatever happens in the finale should appear in the first act, and more importantly, backwards, if you put a gun on the wall in the first act, it's gotta go off in the third. Okay, let's do this. This is our Chekhov's gun. The same thing is gonna happen at the end. Brick is gonna go down, the meteor is gonna hit your ship, and you're gonna end up in space. But this was the safe version, and later you're gonna do the not safe version. So I make it out alive, but one asteroid does clip the ship, meaning I have to go out and repair it, which leads to one of the most beautiful sequences in the whole series, the spacewalk. The music 
in this scene is a cover of Across the Universe by The Beatles, which has shown up on my channel before. It's from my 2014 album Comet, where every single sound except my voice was sampled from a recording of a comet by the European Space Agency. Words are flowing out like endless rain into a paper cup. Here I'd started out trying to create new music to score this scene, but eventually it hit me how perfect it would be to use this cover because, uh, you know, it mentions the universe, it has this beautiful, eerie mood that fits pretty well, but also it was already all made out of space sounds. I think the spacewalk was really like a, just a sci-fi thing that we had to achieve. Being able to just like do this stuff <laughs> and be like, I'm gonna be in space yeah. after all of Phil's work. <laughs> The next main story moment when we arrive at the planet is also a great example of my musical and storytelling worlds getting all mixed up. Prepare for landing. We had the whole landing sequence all shot and the plan for the rest of the episode for years was just this little spot in the script that said, music content. And I just couldn't nail the right feeling for this landing sequence. I tried a bunch of new stuff that didn't work. I tried putting old tracks on top of it that didn't work. And then something happened that beautifully pulled all this together for me. I got a new guitar pedal, the Hologram Microcosm. It actually looks super spacey. This pedal turned out to be very inspiring. It helped me finish an old track that I was working on that I then realized would be a perfect mood for this landing sequence. And then I was able to make the video about this very unique, beautiful sounding pedal, which is the exact kind of content that I love to do on my channel. And this all came together serendipitously just weeks before this video came out. And this project was chaotic like that. There was stuff that was four years in the making and there was stuff that I was coming up with on the fly as the episodes were being released. Landing in 10. The main story was mapped out years in advance, but we really didn't want this series to feel canned. We wanted it to flow out of my existing world. Three, two, one. So this was, I would say, is like the end of act one, sort yes. of. We have like journey to the planet is the first part and then on the planet is the second act. Now we're in a different world entirely. Let's do something with it. This the planet, I just landed. Snapping candy's got an Instagram. When we were writing this, we had no idea what it would be. Not we were like, is it gonna be a cold planet, a hot planet? Like we had <laughs> no idea. Like do we build a cave or do we go to a cave? Ended up doing both. <laughs> We decided that the Mojave Desert, especially Death Valley, would be great for the kind of barren landscapes we needed for our story. And out there, there were also the Mojave Lava Tubes, which could be good for an alien cave. So we headed out there and gave ourselves a week to find and shoot all of the alien planet locations. One week. Turns out, Death Valley is one of the hottest places in the world. It's the driest place in America and I went there to film in an enclosed helmet, wetsuit, and motorcycle boots in the summertime. So we had our shot list to work through and just found the best places we could to capture what we needed, an open space for the spaceship to land, a beautiful lookout, a path that looks like it could lead to a cave. Now, even though this was a jam-packed filming trip and I was spending so much of it sweating and crawling in and out of this wetsuit, it was honestly as enjoyable as any vacation I've been on in my life. Woo, we're doing it. I was with two of my favorite people, my wife and my brother-in-law, just exploring these amazing locations, having fun, making a musical sci-fi show. We did it. We did shooting. It was challenging, but it was good. Also, this uh, drone that I send up to motivate the drone footage, and in the story, it's the probe that helps find uh, the crystals. This is a real drone. It's a cheap toy, it just so happened to match our white, gray, orange color scheme, and uh, it's terrible. Take off. June 2019, we just finished filming the cave stuff. Uh, I'm in my studio right now because I want to show you there's all this stuff everywhere. Most of my gear is covered up and there's a fake cave. These rocks are all made of 
foam. It's just painted styrofoam. The bigger pieces, I'm not actually sure how they were made because we got really lucky and a friend of a friend who was working on some kind of film set uh, knew that these were gonna be thrown out after they were done shooting, so we just rented a U-Haul, picked them up. They were in my backyard for like six months because we weren't ready to use them yet. We knew that we'd have to film multiple days in the lava tubes and that there would be tourists coming in and out sometimes that we'd have to deal with. We weren't confident that we would be able to have a permanent kind of crystal setup that needed to look the same, that needed to be illuminated for all these scenes. And it turns out that we were right. The lava tubes were a challenge to film in because there were just random tourists that would come in anytime, as they had a right to do. We didn't plan this at all. Came down to the cave and uh, met Josh, who brought his chicken outfit. It's perfect. I live here. <laughs> You're in the real cave, and you'd be like, look at these crystals, and we'd like whip pan away, and then like three months later, back at like your studio, we'd like whip pan into like the crystals, and then like whip pan back, and they're like in different countries. We found the time crystals. What was that? What is that? Oh, oh my god. Oh, hello there. I'm recording Horace's lines with Berkeley Pickle. And what is a high five? So Horace is the alien I meet on the planet, completely made with computer graphics, although in the cave to create some real light spill coming off of him onto the walls, uh, we actually put a light on a stick in a Subway sandwich bag. I didn't see anybody pick up on this, but I named him Horace because Horace means time. He's a time crystal. Do they come out of here? Oh my God. What just happened? I'm afraid I can't let you touch them. To me, it, it says so much about a character immediately, how they react to their surroundings and stuff. And for Horace, he looks at you and is non-threatened immediately. I've decided you are very slow and easy to overpower. So that moment does so much work to be like, he's very, very powerful. And he needs to be because what he's doing is kind of, his entire species kind of rests on it. <laughs> It turns out the time crystals belong to Horus, which puts my character in a conundrum because I went on this whole journey just to take the crystals from this planet and now it turns out they belong to him. It turns out they hold together the very fabric of space time. And also Horus and I have started becoming friends. I'm an alien from another dimension, came full of crystals under my protection. So eventually I have to come clean to Horus about the fact that I came to this planet just to harvest these crystals and this obviously creates a rift in our friendship. They're the reason I came to this planet. I came to find more. I'm sorry, Horus. I didn't know how important they are. They're incredibly important. I and every guardian across the universe have sworn to lay down our lives to protect these crystals. Of course, like in any good musical, the emotional moment is when you burst into song. So uh, the next episode is just a music video for my song, Turn Away. This, I think, was the first time we see Brick be, like, a villain villain. If Horace says no, I'm not going to, okay? Very well, Andrew. Just, like, a slow close-up on the eye. It's like, <laughs> come on, you knew! You knew she was evil, you had to have known. No, Andrew, not the dubstep that disabled my systems in a previous episode. I, I have worked uh, as a stage manager as well, and I feel like Brick is a stage manager of this mission, you know? Uh, she's behind the scenes being like, please just do the thing. I just need you to do the thing. Brick, is there a malfunction? Can you open the inner airlock doors? The doors are behaving according to my instructions. What? Crystals obtained. Return to Earth for further study. What? What's going on? Launch sequence initiated. Prepare for launch. You decide you're gonna try and take control of the situation and you use the Chekhov's gun, the thing, we, yeah, the thing we put in the beginning, which is the dubstep, most specifically like that frequency. If you choose to obstruct the procedure, I will be forced to render you unconscious. A lot of people have asked if I could edit all of the story parts into one long video that they can watch, but uh, it doesn't really work like that. It really was made to be these separate YouTube episodes. A lot of the gear demos, the tutorials, the music making, it's all part of the story. No, Andrew, not the dubstep that disabled my systems in a previous video. The whole point is that it's an experiment with format and maybe not a successful one, you can let me know, but one that I wanted to try. That frequency will cause me to melt Function. Riot!
I love that it could be educational, it could be kind of zany and cartoony almost, but then also straight up badass sci-fi action movie. Like some of these scenes, when I watch this, I get the same feeling as when I see the Millennium Falcon. Shout out again to Phil, our one person VFX team. It was the most intense VFX of this entire series and I had the least amount of time to get it all done. Oh no. Wait, are you seeing this? What are you doing? Yeah, I'm parts for us. Where's my dad? Go! All right, so the meteor hits my ship and uh, the video ends right there and my channel goes dark for two months. This was my elaborate way of taking a break from YouTube. Of course I can't make new videos. My spaceship just exploded while I was inside it. And this brings us to the final episode, the most cinematic one of all. I really hope you'll check this one out if you haven't already. There's a lot of interesting stuff to talk about here. The majority of the software that I used was all Blender. I didn't know how to use Blender before this project. I learned how to use it and I just started like ripping apart the model. I like would like copy and paste random stuff, and just like throw it around and like see, see what that looks like. Your ship collided with an asteroid and you were thrown into space. This was the moment where you flip open the crystal thing and you, you see there are crystals there that we know as the audience you could use to time travel. But to do that, you would have to betray the friend that you have been working so hard to protect. He sees you can do it and you don't. And that choice makes you the right person to protect these crystals. So this was another one of the ways that I wanted to involve music in the storytelling, which is this simple classical piano piece that I composed that my character comes up with uh, when I'm thinking I'm gonna die on this planet. It turns out Horace has a way to send me back home, and after we say goodbye, a more polished version of the piece comes in as the soundtrack to me being beamed back to Earth. We do some dramatic Space Odyssey style stuff, stock footage of nature, a bit with my baby. I managed to get this shot where I panned down from the moon to my studio. Felt like that was very fitting. And as the piece comes to a close, you see that it's me back on Earth playing the piano. So it just felt like a nice way to bridge that journey. Shout out to my good friend Nare Sol who actually played the piano on that piece because she is a much better pianist than I am. And uh, if you like it, it's up on streaming services now, by the way, finally released it. It's called Swan Zong. So we end the series with me going off to hide the time crystals. We didn't want to end it with like a perfect ribbon on everything. And we did also hint that I inherited some of Horace's powers. But I don't think we'll be doing a part two. Uh, I'm really glad that we did it. It was some of the most fun I've ever had on my channel, but it's like that Churchill quote about life. The journey has been enjoyable and well worth making, once. I recognize now that Space Time tried to do too many things. It was music tutorials, it was music promo, it was social media commentary and parody. I was trying to tell this space story. I thought I had a vision that pulled all these things together, but in the end, I think most of the elements were weakened by being mixed up with all the others. Looking back, I think the trickiest thing was that as soon as anybody saw any of this as music promotion, everything else was seen through that lens. The space adventure wasn't because I wanted to tell a story, it was just a gimmick for my album. Creating this fictional world wasn't about raising questions about authenticity in social media, it was just confusing, or I was desperate for attention, or jumping the shark. Ultimately, I consider Space Time a creative success. I love the music and the videos and the story that came out of it, but as a promo campaign, iffy, as an experiment with format, hit and miss, and uh, as commentary, kind of a fail. I'd love to hear your thoughts on any of this though, and I hope you enjoyed the videos and the music, but maybe most importantly, I hope we can all remember that the things we see on the internet, we might not have the context for, we might be misunderstanding someone's tone or intentions, or they might not be real at all. Let's go, Brick. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Got it.